Well, good afternoon and welcome to the first meeting of the Justice Subcommittee in Policing in 2015. Could everyone please ensure that mobile phones and other electronic devices are switched off completely as they interfere with the sound system? We've received apologies from Graeme Pearson and the convener, Christine Graeme, who the clerks reliably inform me is involved in shocking members. <laughs> Some people would say it's business as usual, but I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> but that explains why under standing orders as the oldest member present, I'm chairing the, the meeting for the purpose of choosing a temporary convener. Um, could I therefore have nominations for a temporary convener, please? I think you should just keep the chair, convener. <laughs> okay. Very gra grateful for that, uh, I think. <laughs> uh, we've only one nomination, then I shall temporarily <laughs> convene the committee today. Right, could we move to item one, please? This is a decision whether the committee is agreeable to taking item pre, uh, three in private. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you for that. Move now to item two on the agenda, which is an evidence session on progress with development of the I6 programme. And it's my pleasure to welcome Deputy Chief Constable Neil Richardson, designated deputy for the Chief Constable, Chief Superintendent Hamish McPherson, programme manager for I6, and last but not least, Tom McMahon, who is the Director of Strategy and Performance at the Scottish Police Authority. Welcome, gentlemen. We've received um, a, a very comprehensive report from Police Scotland, and um, this includes the, the most recent update on the programme. So given that, can we go straight to questions from members? John, followed by Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, good afternoon, panel. Um, a question about the... Um, the scope of, of I-6 and the fact, um, I understand, uh, perhaps for Mr Richardson this one, it's covering 80% of the current police operational activity, Mr Richardson. In your letter too, as you talk about recent examples, and I quote here, recent examples of that are the inclusion of national vehicle accidents, management solution and e-warrants. Is that adding to the 80% or would that have been in there anyway? Or, and can you tell us what the 20% is, is please? Uh, certainly, uh, by all means. No, these uh, two examples are actually in addition to the initial scope uh, of, of the programme. And throughout the entire journey, I was very cautious to guard the scope. Uh, and I think even around uh, in this forum previously, I, I described that and the importance of making sure that you don't allow mission creep to distract from delivery. However, um, clearly the passage of uh, time between concept and the delivery is, is in this case a number of years and the world does move on it, it does kind of it is important that we keep <laughs> up with uh, dynamic arrangements that take place within the policing environment so both of those uh, additions uh, have gone on to basically reflect that e warrants is i think a really good example uh, of the start of genuine uh, digital exchange of documents which uh, it currently takes place uh, beyond the boundaries of police scotland into the justice uh, arena uh, and it almost serves as a kind of testing ground for further development in that space moving forward so beyond the the benefits that that brings i think it also opens uh, our thinking and opportunities for more such activity uh, moving forward the uh, road collisions element of it is something that uh, directly fits in to the spirit and the, the benefits that flow from I-6. It was originally out with the scope, but as we moved forward from an organisational point of view, it became apparent that this was something that was going to have to run in parallel, uh, and there was an opportunity in discussing uh, various changes that were happening just by due process uh, to incorporate that within it. So with agreement of Accenture, that has now been included. I should say both of these additions uh, have taken place without further cost uh, to, to Police Scotland, so it's included within the initial contract. That's very reassuring. Can I ask in relation to the e-warrants, I think you're right that there's a, a wider future agenda there. Can you give a reassurance that that's compatible with your criminal justice partners, Crown Office Procurator, Fiscal Service, whoever? Because we heard before about the, 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 them in, in another forum, indeed perhaps at the Justice Committee rather than this committee, about the unique nature of... Um, communicating electronically um, reports and that. Is this all compatible? Um, the simple answer to that is yes. I might invite Hamish to provide a, a little more <coughs> uh, technical detail, but in essence, we, we uh, 
Uh, I think I've previously mentioned that we have now a, a cross-disciplinary group that's been brought into being, so uh, colleagues and partners from a number of different uh, disciplines are actively uh, uh, consulted with and involved in the development moving forward. So th this is done with the full visibility of that group. Hamish, do you want to extend that? Yeah, I th thanks, convener members. Uh, yeah, just to add to that, the, uh, the e warnings functionality we're putting in is entirely is just compliance. So the integration of Scottish Criminal Justice Information Systems data standards uh, have been set with all the partnership groups through that criminal justice meeting. And this is purely us reflecting that within the I6 application. Uh, as I think Mr. Hipman and uh, the DEP described the last time, it was always ex described to be an extensible application. It was always described so we could extend it, change it as years go by. Uh, this came up as an opportunity. Crown were very, very keen to move towards an e-warrants. We are very, very keen. There are huge labour savings within it. We currently have an archaic paper system for warrants where a paper warrant is sent to a station and then is manually routed to an officer who then goes and deals with the warrant. This is an electronic system, comes and will be routed automatically by the application, and then a log of all the activity for that warrant will be held within the application, and also, in due course, will be also available to our criminal justice colleagues. So. Right. And, and just to confirm, would that, for instance, include the Scottish Prison Service? Would they? But the Scottish Prison Service are part of that criminal justice group. I mean, I6, as it currently stands, is getting rolled out for police officers initially, but was always intended to have partner organisations. Apart from the else, it's a saving for Police Scotland there. So, for instance, when a warrant is executed or can't be executed and Crown ask for an update regarding all the activities taking place, currently we manually produce that. Under I6, they will simply be able to go in and view the log that's held against that warrant. Okay, thank you. I wonder, Mr. Richardson, you, you said that this has come up in the course uh, and you, you wanted to, to contain the specification initially. Is there anything else in the horizon that's likely to come up as being maybe matters out with your control emanating from this building, indeed? Not in effectively because of the stage we're at in terms of delivery uh, the design phase is now complete so in essence um, we're beyond the part uh, where adjustments to scope could be made that said there will be uh, potential for subsequent after rollout uh, additions to, to be made and I think that there's a great deal of scope uh, there to uh, perhaps extend things that are currently done in a sort of remote or independent fashion incorporate that either into I6 or something that's compatible with I6. But these are sort of all subsequent conversations. Uh, and the trick there is to effectively just make sure we stay focused on the delivery of I6 as a distinct entity uh, whilst we're developing strategic plans around ICT requirement and then consider at every stage how these are brought together. But that's all ongoing work. And one sort of overall question, a, a small question but a very big one. No Milestone not reached, no payment made. Is that still the position? That has been the principle uh, all the way through. It became a little more complicated on the last milestone uh, where, um, again, for, uh, for convenience to some extent, uh, I breached that principle uh, and retained some money but made the bulk of the payment. That was for a number of reasons, but largely because um, from our perspective there were some elements that were more sitting in our uh, space than it was the supplier's space. Uh, however, that has now been fully delivered delivered and the payment has been made. So in essence, it was just a slight breach to that principle, but I'm reverting back to uh, where I originally stood. Unless it is completely delivered, uh, there will be no payments. Okay, thank you. That's really sure. Thank you. Okay, I, I've been very remiss in not acknowledging the attendance of Hugh Henry, MSP, um, and also Shadow Justice Spokesman of the committee to today. Kevin? Uh, thank you, um, Convener. Uh, in your letter to um, the <coughs> subcommittee, uh, DCC Richardson, uh, you say uh, quite clearly uh, that in terms of the contract variation, uh, there has been no additional costs. Is that correct? Yes, that's, that's correct. In terms of the contract uh, arrangements, yes. In terms of the contract variation itself, which we discussed in some depth um, the last time you were here to discuss I6, what has been the changes in terms of the timetabling um, to the delivery, the complete delivery of the I6 system? Well, in summary, the, the, the standout uh, fact, which uh, I'm keen to stress, is that the final rollout has remained uh, where it uh, originally was. So after the contract variation, 
uh, I think it was September 2016 is when we expect it all to be delivered uh, and us to have a, a, a complete national system rolled out uh, fully. That has remained the case. Uh, there has been some adjustment and there has been some change, um, but these changes effectively haven't altered that end point. So in essence, uh, there has been a, a, a delay to enable us to make sure that the design is absolutely accurate and that we are completely content that what we are asking to be built was was exactly what is required. Uh, and I, I still believe that that is necessary. If you don't get that right, you will pay a heavy price later when something is built that doesn't do exactly what you wanted it to do. Uh, and that will come out during testing. So to avoid that, uh, we uh, negotiated a period where we allowed more time. Uh, however, um, that did not compromise the rollout date and there's a couple of reasons for that. As we move forward in terms of the uh, delivery and the, the detail uh, construction, things become clear that weren't perhaps clear when you were initially uh, procuring something or, or bidding for it. Uh, and that's just a, a product of once you get right into the detail of it, you become um, <coughs> clearer about what's required. So as a consequence, uh, we adjusted the way uh, that the, the, the product was going to be built. So for example, there was one element of that that we'd made a, a significant time provision for, which was around um, data, uh, backloading data. Uh, we uh, And I could go into technical details, but I, I suspect you don't have much of a head to uh, hear that technical um, uh, description. I do, I do have a, an interest because at the end of the day, what you're saying with the contract variation that has been put in place um, after your initial di di uh, difficulties with the supplier, you're saying that that contract variation uh, has had no additional cost and beyond that, um, this will still be delivered on time. And yet at the same time, you're saying that there have been time changes built in uh, to ensure the delivery by September 2016. Yeah. And I, I, I am really quite interested uh, in how there can be the changes to that timescale um, from the original contract um, uh, and still achieve um, the, um, the delivery date or the operational date of, of 2016. So if you could explain that, I think it would be extremely useful. The, the two principal areas related to the one I've just you know, clumsily mentioned, which is around data migration. So the original plan around that was quite complicated and uh, as, a, as a consequence of some uh, things that came to light and some better understanding of the requirement, uh, an alternative approach uh, around a data store, which Hamish is largely the architect of, um, was put forward as a better uh, option. That enabled us, if we progressed that particular option, to save around three months uh, of, of time, without any detriment, just by taking a different approach. Uh, the second area related to... Could you explain that? A different approach, because um, yeah. does it mean that that data store, does it mean that that data does not go into the I6 system no, no. Um, at that particular point. I, I, I mean, it would be helpful for us in, in layman's terms in some regards to know what you mean by that. I, I shall endeavour to do it in layman's terms. The original application in the row the application was predicated on each legacy force having the data from his legacy systems migrated at the time of go-live. What we've done is moved our forward. So actually some months ago, we started migrating the data into a thing called the operational data store. Now, all the data with an I6 anyway will end up within this operational data store. If you like, it's a data warehouse for all information held by Police Scotland. That information is then available to all I6 users through a legacy search button, which has been introduced as part of this functionality as well. We actually believe it's a much, much better and stronger way of presenting legacy data because it makes it not only available to I6, but when we move on to the 20%, which is not within I6, for instance, command and control, it will equally make that legacy data available for command and control systems, etc. So it's not about not doing it, it's about doing it in a different and we actually believe a much stronger and better way. Uh, that sounds a lot more logical to me than your original proposal. So why was that not decided to move in that direction at the initial stages of the... Of the very swiftly answer that, which is it's just a matter of timing. When I6 was obviously first contracted for, etc., it was contracted as a national solution for eight legacy forces, 
what we now have obviously is one national force, so it makes much more sense uh, rationalising all the legacy data into one national data store, and that's the reason for it. Okay, um, thank you for that. Um, in terms of the uh, milestones, which we've had an interest in previously too, um, you, you have set out the, the milestones previously, um, and again, uh, we have some indication of the milestones and in, uh, in what we have uh, in front of us today. Um, but I note uh, from your letter to the committee, uh, DCC Richardson, um, talk of milestone uh, 5B. Um, now, I think, as I've said to you guys before, uh, having uh, had some experience previously uh, of major IT uh, projects, uh, when uh, the numbers start having letters added to them, uh, which normally means a new milestone, that has indicated to me in the past that there may be uh, some difficulties. Uh, was it the case that previously um, there was no 5B? Um, what is uh, 5B? What was 5A? Because I take it there will have been a 5A. And in terms of the other milestones, are we likely um, to see changes within, uh, uh, within those two? Yeah, I mean, the, the answer to that is simply, this is what I was alluding to in the answer to the previous question, which is the principles so far have been unless uh, the milestones are met in, in, in their entirety, then there is no payment made. Um, the milestones themselves usually complain, uh, contain a number of component parts, uh, and this was an example of that. Uh, we were faced as a programme board with a situation where um, around 80% of the milestone had been complete uh, and completed to a, a good standard and on time, but a small element of it uh, had not. Uh, and as I said, uh, there were elements of that that were within our uh, area to, to, to resolve. Uh, and therefore, uh, on this single instance, it seemed appropriate uh, for that and some other uh, additional reasons to allow payment for the elements of it that were complete, uh, allowing a, a slightly extended time period for the finalisation of the last element. Now, that was agreed, it was progressed, and the final element of that milestone was delivered on time and on message into a high quality. So, in essence, it was a slight diversion, uh, but the rationale and reasoning, I, I think, was sensible uh, and, again, enabled um, a, a number of interest to be uh, addressed by taking that approach rather than a very kind of robust one to effectively penalise the supplier uh, financially having completed the vast majority of that milestone. I think it would be helpful if, yeah. if you could put some time frames on it. There's been a slight slippage and when you're talking about milestones as, long as, as well as talking about the content, if you could put that in context with the dates. I think that helps to make yeah. it a wee bit better. I think it would also be very useful for us to know what these elements actually were. Um, you know, um, I think it's always useful for us to, to try and get this into some kind of context, what these difficulties actually were. James has got the details in front of him, so I'm going to invite him. Four, wouldn't it, that where the first slippage was? No, no, Milestone 4 stood alone as the, tra uh, the training mobilisation plan. Milestone 5 consisted of two main elements. The first element was the functional design complete element of it, and the second element of it was the detailed implementation plan. As, as Mr Richardson has attested to, uh, there was a... If you like, the work for the functional design was complete. We were completely happy with it, and therefore we were happy to sign against it. But we still felt at that point in time we had some work to do with the detailed implementation plan for Police Scotland to feel confident regarding the testing programme, etc., to make sure we got a robust product when we went live with it. So the decision was to separate the two. With regards to the date, the initial date of the functional design complete under the, uh, the, the CVA was 8.8.14 and was signed off at 16.10.14. And then one month later, we were then happy the next board to sign off against the detailed implementation plan, which was 28.11.14. So that's, that's the timing for two. But as I say, there were two actually standalone elements. They just happened to initially be wrapped up within the same milestone. Okay. Uh, finally, um, in, in terms of uh, the future, 
uh, to the point of of the going uh, live uh, and the system becoming operational. Do you foresee um, at this moment in time any difficulties that may lead to further uh, contract variation or further changes um, to any of the, the milestones? I mean, I think what I would say firstly is that where we are at the moment I'm very pleased we've now managed to complete the design uh, which is a major major milestone in its own right and we've completed that uh, to a level of satisfaction from our perspective uh, which is directly in line with the kind of principles of re retaining the functions and in terms of the contract which was effectively to provide um, our um, requirements uh, specifically uh, meet our, re our requirements. So that has been uh, completed. Um, the reality, however, is that in the delivery of any major program like this that runs for a number of years and has the kind of complexities that this one uh, does, it never follows a linear path. Uh, and so effectively what I, I can do is uh, sit in front of you today and say that our, our principles have remained uh, consistent. We've got an end date that has not altered since the contract variation. Um, our costs are remaining constant and in fact the, uh, the, the functionality that we expect to have delivered and was contained within the business case is exactly what is now designed. Uh, that said, as you know, there have been some variations on, on the route. Uh, there have been some slippages, some things have changed in, in terms of the nature, and, and that is the reality of programme delivery. So what we are now embarking upon, now that the design is complete, and actually the elements of this, kind of, to use a kind of mechanical uh, metaphor, the elements of the engine have been constructed, and we're now at the stage of putting these elements together to see if the engine actually runs smoothly. Uh, now, in any such process, there will be issues. There will be things that we didn't expect, and there will be um, adjustments that will require to be made. Uh, the, the confident proposition that I can put forward is I will continue to hold true to the principles that I have up until now, um, but it's in all probability there will be things we need to adapt to and adjust to. Uh, I've got no reason to think that that will be problematic or will lead to another contract variation, uh, but it would be wrong to give you a sense that now we're at this point, everything is going to be plain sailing all the way through. That is not the case. This is an incredibly difficult, challenging uh, programme, and I would imagine it will continue to be uh, that, that way. Uh, but at the moment, we're in a good place. Um, I would never expect anyone dealing with an IT contract to uh, tell us that it would be plain sailing because uh, having uh, dealt with a number in the past, um, they never are. Um, but I think one of the things which the committee um, had concerns about um, and I think would uh, be concerned about again um, is that contract variation. You had a contract variation um, quite early on in a programme. Um, it didn't cost um, the public purse any more money. Um, uh, thank God for that. Um, but I think what I am keen to know, um, and I think others would be similar, is uh, if, uh, if there is likely to be any other contract variation. Uh, in these circumstances, I always get rather perplexed at the fact that the original tenders uh, sometimes in, in IT situations uh, don't seem to take account or allow for the flexibility um, that is likely to take during uh, the construct uh, of that particular programme. And I, I, I would uh, again say, um, do you foresee at this moment in time any contract variation taking place in the near future? I'm not planning for it, and I don't envisage any contract variation uh, imminent in, in terms of this. And I would also probably go on to say that what you're describing uh, is right, uh, and it was an incredibly difficult part of this, this delivery. Um, and, and we've rehearsed some of the detail before, so I won't do it again. But it is reasonable to say that the arrangements, the working arrangements with uh, the supplier uh, are in a far better place uh, as we sit here today than they were earlier on. Uh, and uh, I think it's uh, also 
also fair to say that the Accenture have been working uh, very um, purposefully with our team uh, to um, overcome some fairly significant challenges. And in fact, even into the testing phase, the early point that we've had uh, so far has indicated that we've had slightly more uh, niggles, or however you want to describe them, uh, issues uh, raised than perhaps we might have planned for. Uh, but we've also had a higher number of those resolved more rapidly than we would have planned for. Uh, and I think that that underlines the fact that the working relationship between ourselves and the supplier is actually in a pretty good place right now. So again, I'm always, as, as, as you know, I'm always very guarded in terms of giving predictions for the future. These things are incredibly difficult. But as we stand here uh, right now, uh, I think uh, we're in a reasonable place and I don't an anticipate any uh, changes that will lead to contract variation. Convener. And certainly you won't have a crystal ball and I, I hope the, the committee scrutiny when you were having the problems and the interest we took probably helped to foster these good relations and um, clearly the full business uh, requirements have been built in by working together so hopefully if anything else came up in the future it would be the same, um, the same kind of uh, arrangement and relationship that would, would materialise. Alison. Thank you very much. Um, convener. Uh, good afternoon, DCC Richardson. Um, so you've said now you've successfully designed and built the, the, the system and you're, you've already entered the six-month um, testing phase and that will be followed by um, a, a user acceptance test phase before you go live. Can you give us a bit more detail about exactly what these two phases um, entail, particularly around about the user acceptance? Do you intend to run it in parallel or have a pilot group using it? How, how do you process this is one I probably will hand over to the technical expert that can give you more detail. It is also an area that has slightly changed as a consequence of the adjustment, so I'll maybe ask Hamish to answer that. Thanks. I'll, I'll try not to get technical. Uh, t testing has gone on for some time uh, with regards to as soon as we started building the product, it immediately goes into testing. Most of those test phases at that time sits with the supplier. It starts off with the unit testing, which is testing the individual components, then assembling those components together, which is assembly testing, and we're through most parts of assembly testing already, and then goes into product testing. Product testing again sits with the supplier and is an end-to-end -end test of the application by the supplier. The changes we've made here is that we are actually involved fully in that product testing. Uh, again, I'll not get technical with that because that's again broken down into several tranches of it, uh, but we'll certainly be very heavily involved in what we describe as type 3 product testing, where we will do end-to-end -end scenario testing across the whole product. Having done that, and the reason for us doing that earlier is that by the time we get to user acceptance testing, we should have already flattened out most of the bugs within the system, because there will be bugs in any system uh, at that point in time. Then we get into user acceptance testing. That is a customer uh, activity, so that's actually dealt with by us. So for the last many months, we've been writing lots of scenarios which are based on real-life policing scenarios, missing people, vulnerable people, crime events, etc., custody events. And then when we get to user acceptance testing, we will simply run these right through over the user acceptance testing piece. And as a result of that, uh, we should hopefully have a completely robust product by the time we go live with it. And with the times we've got set aside for it, I'm absolutely confident that will be the case. So let me be clear, the, the user acceptance tests are, are kind of um, fake scenarios that you're using. It's not actual police on the ground using the system. No, so no. user acceptance testing is always done with, if, if you like, dummy data. That's, that's the way it is done. Uh, it will get done in the full live environment, so it's a complete mirror of the live environment, but not with live data. We then go into our pilot area, which is when we start rolling out across Scotland. So the first rollout here is a longer uh, period than for the rest of the divisions, and that is also a pilot area to ensure we have no problems. By that time, we should have very, very few. Okay, and obviously, um, significant to that is the training needs then. Can you um, talk to us a little bit more um, about the training strategy and your training needs analysis that you've done? Yes, I, I mean, the training strategy has gone on for some significant time alongside with Accenture, and again, it's based on scenario-based. So rather than training the functionality of the application, we train it as if it's a day in the life of a police officer. So the way they'll actually come in is they'll come in and, and deal with it as if they would be using the application on the ground. 
Uh, there's a training needs analysis being done against each of the legacy forces, to be honest with you, because each person has a diff currently has a different IT infrastructure and a different knowledge of IT systems. Some had some corporate systems already, some had standalone systems, so it will be tailored to their own individual needs. There's bespoke training for police officers, for police supervisors, and then there's also expert training for people working in areas such as custody, crime management, case management, etc. People that are testing it and uh, even at the user testing stage are people that are very familiar with the system, the people that have designed the system and your, your project team that have been working with it. Surely the risky area is when it actually goes live and the real officers start to use it. Um, and what happens, what contingency have you there if the, the real users actually identify problems in the system? When we get into product testing, that will absolutely be design and work leads for the system. The people who designed the system to test if what they've tested is actually what we are getting delivered. When we get to user acceptance testing, it's absolutely not those people. It's subject matter experts from the, from the force across each of the areas which are testing. So when we test custody, it will be custody officers who do a live custody job. When we test criminal justice, it will be people working in a criminal justice scenario. So user acceptance testing is tested against dummy data, but it is tested with the real subject matter experts testing it. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I can just perhaps add, add to that. I mean, in terms of, we've talked before about I6 and the significance of it, but it, in truth, it really is transformational change in action. And so once we move into the training kind of environment, it, going beyond just how you use a new computer system, it's actually changing the way they do their business. And so our investment around that, um, that, um, that capability to ensure people understand, you know, how they need to operate in this new environment is, is absolutely key. So it is based on three days classroom training. There's some pre-work, there's some post-work, and there will be ongoing support, etc., for these officers. It's a big commitment. It will have a major impact on the organisation. There's no getting away from that. Uh, but it's fundamentally important if we are going to transition into a new way of working with all the benefits that we know uh, that will deliver. Thank you. I could just clarify something, um, DC uh, Richardson. In your letter, uh, page two, you talk about milestone seven, uh, a detailed approach to build um, a phase and wider technical architect was approved, and um, that was December the 10th. A six-month detailed project test phase has commenced and will be followed by regular user acceptance. Later on in your, your paper, which is more detailed, uh, paragraph 7, you refer to there now follows eight months of detailed and di diligent testing by um, Accenture and Police Scotland for Milestone 7. Am I reading that properly? Is that a discrepancy or is it...? No. Can I perhaps pick up convenience? What that is is the difference between uh, unit testing, assembly testing, product testing, and user acceptance testing. That's the, the, the first one relates specifically to product testing. The other one relates to the cycle, if that makes sense. So they're, they're different testings? Yes. There's, yeah. there's all sorts of product, te product and inverted commas testing, but product testing itself is a, specifically a, a specific activity. And they're both in milestone seven, but just different testing times for... That's, milestone yeah. seven, basically it's a cycle. So you go through unit testing into assembly testing into product testing, and milestone seven is a successful conclusion of product testing, if that makes sense. That's very helpful. Um, governance has clearly been a huge um, issue with other public sector contracts. Um, so can I ask you about the, uh, just to update really on the position of governance going forward more, more generally, because having overcome quite a significant problem and, and overcome it, it seems quite successfully, you, we wouldn't want in any way the eye to be off the ball. Um, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I mean, in, in essence, I'm not sure that we were ever in a in a, an atrociously weak position around governance, uh, but the, it's true that effectively we went through a major change to policing arrangements uh, midway through the delivery of I6. That's the reality of that. And so we were asking a brand newly appointed police authority uh, to get their heads around not just the policing environment, but the, the technical complexity of, of a business case, um, which is, I, I guess, fair to say, not an easy read. 
Um, so uh, there, there were some challenges there. The programme governance arrangements were uh, very robust in my view and again we have initiated gateway health checks all the way through this and uh, again the comfort around those governance arrangements were um, articulated very clearly in the reports we, we received. Um, around and about the time that uh, we were developing the arrangements with the police authority, and Tom might perhaps uh, comment on this himself in a second, but um, we did initiate a specific, uh, almost thematic gateway uh, looking at governance. Uh, and again, they, they fed back some recommendations that we were able to consider and, and look at to make the arrangements more robust. So where we currently... Uh, stand I think is um, significantly uh, advanced from where we were uh, and that's right for the stage of the programme that we're at. We have a programme board that have a number of interested parties, a number of executive colleagues from Police Scotland. We also have a representative uh, who has specialist knowledge from Scottish Government uh, and Tom now sits on the board and prior to him uh, John Foley, the accountable officer, sat on the board uh, directly as well. Uh, there are a number of areas that the police authority uh, invite papers and we provide updates to, uh, including the Finance and Investment Committee uh, and, and others that I'm, I'm sure Tom might wish to comment on. Uh, and so collectively, we've got um, a fairly robust opportunity to deal with uh, the detailed programme elements and make sure they are fed up and uh, deal with the more strategic issues and decisions uh, through the police authority up to and including uh, a regular input that's provided by me to the full authority uh, on a quarterly basis. So, Tom? You've mentioned as well. So, if a key person were to leave or, or not be available for any reason, is there a contingency plan to ensure that that wouldn't be a real problem or obstacle in, in the governance and the um, timeframes? Absolutely. I mean, we've, and we've had that. Um, clearly, as you would expect, uh, th there are occasions that individuals uh, are not available. The, the, the point of the delivery now, um, we, we did not have the director of HR, for example, as a routine member, but with the um, development of the training requirement and the change activities that will uh, be um, by necessity involved in the delivery of the next stage of this. Uh, John uh, Gillis became a member uh, before at the tail end of last year uh, and now is very active on the board and, and assisting us with us. So, uh, and again, there are uh, uh, opportunities that if they're not available, their deputy can sit on the board. So I'm not um, uncomfortable at all with regard to uh, our resilience, really, uh, from that point of view. Anything to add, Mr. Whitman? Really just endorse what the DCC has said. I sit on the programme board, so we're well integrated in terms of the internal governance within Police Scotland. Um, our Finance and Investment Committee receives a report at each meeting on uh, spend, again, uh, the profile of the spend around I-6. The Audit and Risk Committee is monitoring those risks. Um, the full board is receiving updates on I-6 related risks. And I suppose most recently, the development of our ICT Governance and Scrutiny Forum which is chaired by the chief executive of the SPA. It involves DCC Richardson, members of his team, um, as well as uh, the, chair of the chair of the authority and the chairs of both the finance and the audit committees. I think that's very reassuring. Can I thank the panellists for, for coming? Um, I think we, are, we had a very much better session today and a much more upbeat session than I think the last time we met. So hopefully that's how it's going to continue in the future. Can we now move into private sessions? <coughs>